Welcome to Dr. Park's Breathe Better, Sleep Better, Live Better podcast, where our goal is to help you get the sleep you need for the life you want. I'm Dr. Stephen Park, an ENT doctor and sleep medicine physician, and author of the Amazon bestseller, Sleep Interrupted, a physician reveals the number one reason why so many of us are sick and tired. As you can see, this is my first podcast and video. If you prefer the audio version only, that's available as well. For our inaugural video podcast interview, I'm so happy to have joined with us Dr. Stasha Gomanak, who is a returning guest, with her past interviews on vitamin D and gut health, gathering some of the highest views and downloads out of our 90 episodes so far. In this fascinating 90-minute interview, Dr. Gomanak will reveal how vitamin D is linked to acetylcholine, an important brain neurotransmitter, acetylcholine's role in sleep, and new findings about vitamin B5, or pantothetic acid. Before we delve into our topic for today, I'd like to remind our listeners that the information you hear today is for general education and information purposes only and should not be relied upon as personal medical advice. Please consult your doctor before following any advice or regimen given on this show as your particular case may be different than the ones given. Before we begin the interview, a bit of background information about Dr. Gomanak. She received her MD from the Baylor College of Medicine. She then completed her neurology residency in 1989 at Harvard's Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. She then practiced as a general neurologist in in the San Francisco Bay Area for 13 years. Dr. Gomanak then moved to Tyler, Texas and began to concentrate on treating neurological illnesses by improving sleep. She published a pivotal article in 2012 proposing that the global struggle with worsening sleep was linked to reduced sun exposure. And in 2016, she followed with a second article linking the change in the intestinal microbiome to the epidemic of poor sleep and described a simple process for normalizing sleep and the intestinal microbiome called right sleep. In 2016, she retired from private practice to have more time to teach. She currently divides her time between teaching individuals through virtual coaching sessions and teaching clinicians as well in a variety of medical and dental fields. Now let's join in on the interview. So we have with us Dr. Stasha Gomanak back with us again. I think it's been about two years since we last saw you for our last interview, right? So um, yeah, it's been two years. <laughs> and, wow. and I'm sure a lot has new developments have been um, coming up in the past two years. That I'm sure you can tell us about. Uh, but I'm really thankful to, for you to uh, join us again on this interview for taking time out from your busy schedule. Um, for our um, benefit of our audience, uh, people who don't know you, can you just describe who you are and um, what you're doing right now and um, how you came to became, be involved in uh, sleep and vitamin D? Thank you for inviting me, Stephen. It's always a pleasure. And this is our third interview, which mm-hmm. really makes it fun for me. Uh, I oh, didn't our, first, our first video. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, this is our first webinar and we have a mm-hmm. podcast. Um, I'm a neurologist and I'm currently in practice in a small town in East Texas. And I became interested in sleep uh, approximately 16 years ago because one of my headache patients got better with a CPAP device and she was young and healthy and didn't fit the usual parameters. So I really got interested in sleep. I love sleep now. I'm very, very interested in how to make people sleep better. So over the years, I've learned an awful lot about the chemistry of sleep, and I got into some areas that are really new ideas. Uh, The first being that vitamin D that we make from the sun helps us sleep better, and that vitamin D that we make from the sun also makes our microbiome uh, strong, and that both vitamin D and the microbiome contribute to sleeping normally. So those discoveries have led to a big change in my life. I stopped practicing neurology, and I'm now a sleep coach. And I'll stop there and let you ask me any other questions. You know, um, I was reminded to contact you again after I came across your interview with Dr. Mercola. And that was a fascinating interview. And we're going to go over some of the concepts that you discussed with him. Um, but... Um, Actually, let's talk about the most fascinating thing that you talked about with him was his the role of acetylcholine and its, it's myriad of ways it affects our sleep or brain or gut. Um, and I think you have some new insights into that, new studies to talk about, right? 
I do. Um, I'm um, I'm I'm a little bit of a uh, a weirdo about acetylcholine now. I mean, the public doesn't really recognize that name, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a background. Great. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter. So if you've heard of epinephrine, that's what makes us go into fight flight when we're frightened. Um, that's what we talk about all the time with stress is epinephrine. The opposite side of the nervous system that runs automatic control in our body. So the excitement side is epinephrine, but the rest and digest side is run by a chemical called acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is one of the oldest neurotransmitters ever described. Early pharmacologists learned about acetylcholine when they were studying big individual nerves. The nerves that go to the muscle use this particular chemical to talk from the nerve that goes from the spinal cord to the muscle. So the original experiments were done using animal models and large squid nerves. And so much of the early pharmacology was about this drug and the receptors for acetylcholine are muscarinic or nicotinic. So you may not recognize muscarine, but nicotine is readily uh, recognized by lay people. And the reason why that's important is because acetylcholine is one of the chemicals that goes low when we go inside. So when we move indoors and we don't have exposure to the sun, through a combination of vitamin D and what happens to the microbiome, we lose our acetylcholine supply. And oddly enough, there are no other drugs for acetylcholine. Nicotine is the only drug. So. I'm going to talk a lot about it, but it's going to be pretty new ideas because most of us doctors learn about what the neurotransmitters do by using drugs. So we'll, we'll start into this a little bit slowly, but mm -hmm. we've made nicotine into a villain and it does have problems when you smoke cigarettes, but in actual fact, it's just a chemical. Acetylcholine is one of the major chemicals that allow us to fall asleep, stay asleep, and get paralyzed. So if you've ever had a friend who got up in the middle of the night and smoked a cigarette and then went back to sleep, and you ever puzzled over that, like mm -hmm. that stuff would make me all buzz up and vomit. Okay. If I took an inhale, if I inhaled, inhaled a cigarette, I would get nervous and then usually barf. Well, that means that your acetylcholine level inside you is normal, and you just added a whole big wallop of this stuff, nicotine, that mimics the effects of acetylcholine. But the people that are addicted to nicotine frequently are addicted because their acetylcholine levels in their brain are too low. So we use acetylcholine during the day to concentrate, stay alert, and stay focused. And oddly enough, we use exactly the same chemical at night to fall asleep, stay asleep, and get paralyzed correctly so we can heal our body. So those guys that get up in the middle of the night and smoke a cigarette is because they can't sleep without it. Mm -hmm. So with that as a platform, there are all these new things that we're learning about how acetylcholine plays a role in our neurology, multiple different diseases. But two of the most important ones, ADHD, ADD, both epidemics that have happened over the same 40-year span that we know the vitamin D levels have been low, those are because kids who have low vitamin D levels and the raw microbiome don't have enough acetylcholine in their brain to be allow them to focus. So oddly enough, when we moved indoors, when we kept our kids inside, and we were following the recommendations of our colleagues by not being out in the sun, we shorted them of some other really important chemicals. Some of the original research that's coming out substantiating the fact that kids with ADD don't have enough acetylcholine in the front part of their brain to be able to concentrate. When they get to the end, to the discussion of the article, what they say is, well, why are we giving them epinephrine? We're actually giving them things like Adderall or Vyvanse, the medicines that are like amphetamines, which actually increase epinephrine. 
we really should be giving them acetylcholine. And then the next sentence is, but the only drug we have is nicotine. So how are you going to convince those moms to let their kids smoke cigarettes so they can concentrate in class? It's not going to happen. So the irony of that is I got into this field in this roundabout way through a series of accidents. So I'm going to tell you that story and why acetylcholine became so important to me. So I'm going to tell you first the arrival of why it's important, and then I'm going to tell you how I got there. So what happened to me was I was very interested in sleep. I first used sleeping pills and CPAP masks, and then somewhat by accident, I found out that most of my patients who did not have sleep apnea, they just didn't have the right phases of sleep. So there was a whole group of women, young, healthy females, headache sufferers, who did not have enough rapid eye movement sleep on their sleep studies. Because they didn't stop breathing, I really couldn't pass it off to my pulmonologist buddies who would do a CPAP device. That's the way we've been thinking about it. They know they didn't sleep, they have sleep apnea. No, they just don't get into the right phases of sleep. Well, that kind of means it's still within neurology. It's in the brain, in the part of the brain that makes us go into rapid eye movement sleep. So I've got sleep studies on all these women. It turns out they all have low vitamin Ds. And then I get into this very amazing literature written by a guy named Walter Stump that explains the fact that vitamin D has receptors all over the brain and explains what vitamin D does in a larger context. Because vitamin D is now hitting the front pages during the coronavirus epidemic, we're starting to make it commonly known that D is not just about the bones, that it's really not a vitamin. It's really a hormone. It has a huge role to play in our immune system, but it also is pivotal for our sleep. If you look at it in a slightly different way, oh, why would this hormone that's made on the skin from sunlight hitting the skin have anything to do with sleep? Well, because of hibernation. So animals that live in the far north, including us, would have to sleep for longer periods of time so that we can conserve our energy because there's much less food. So that means our sleep is linked to two phases of our planet that are both linked through vitamins, interestingly enough. The daily wake-sleep cycle is attached to vitamin A because light enters the eye uses retinoids in our retina. Vitamin A is a retinoid that goes into the pineal gland and links us to the 24-hour movement of our planet. So we have a sleep-wake cycle. It's eight hours of sleep and the rest is awake. But there's a second cycle of the planet, a 365-day-a-year cycle, and vitamin D, again, it's sunlight-driven. Sunlight on the skin this time makes the hormone that makes our sleep longer in the winter and gain weight in the winter. It's a big survival advantage in the past to be able to coordinate your fertility when you have your babies, when you gain weight, and what your metabolism is doing to whether or not there's snow on the ground. You could actually make it through the winter on one piece of dried meat a week. We don't see it that way anymore because we go to the grocery store. So we've become very detached from the idea that we as human beings are also attached to the sun, to the cycles of the planet. So that's the background, the evolutionary way to look at why vitamin D would be involved. And then we step away from that a moment and say, oh, does that mean that vitamin D is related to my fertility? Yeah. There is a direct connection between the D level and your ability to ovulate and have a baby. What does that mean? That means all the infertility work in this country that costs a lot of money is really about just going outside and getting your vitamin D level up. All the polycystic ovarian syndrome, all the endometriosis, all the painful periods, they're all directly related to vitamin D. Not even speaking about the sleep effects. So after toying with vitamin D for two years and finding out an awful lot, and um, it If there's only one thing you take away from this this interview today, it's that you should never, ever be taking large doses of vitamin D without doing your vitamin D blood levels. I have a whole website that's dedicated to how to use this chemical safely, 
It's dangerous, you can hurt yourself, and you must follow your blood levels, just like every other hormone. You would never just go down to the store and buy yourself some thyroid hormone and start taking it because you felt like it. You really need to do blood levels. Stephen, any questions at that point? Yeah. Um, wow. It, I, I, love the, I love the way that you kind of bring all these different disparate concepts together. And you know, we started off before with vitamin D and the, and the B complex vitamins. Now you bring in acetylcholine. Let me just make a comment about acetylcholine. As a sleep doctor, um, I had to kind of go back to my you know, basic science, neurochemistry, and bio, you know, tra neurotransmitters. So proud of you. And, and I met, you know, I have to say that when I was studying for this for the boards, that was the hardest part for me. I mean, if you being a neurologist, it's probably easy for you, but for an ENT surgeon, it's really challenging to memorize all the neurotransmitters and the pathways. But one thing that I did remember, and you kind of elicited this, this concept um, recently, is that acetylcholine, as you mentioned, it's used to um, produce REM sleep in the ponds. And that's what paralyzes the muscles. But it's also used in the basal forebrain to cause arousal. And if you think about it, REM sleep, the brain state is the same as when you're awake in REM state, except your muscles are paralyzed. That makes, so that makes total sense that acetylcholine activates your brain and the ponds, but simultaneously, when you're sleeping, it, it paralyzes your muscles. You're, you're, even for a neurologist, frankly, those pathways for all the neurotransmitters and the this inhibits this and this turn is mm -hmm. utterly overwhelming. It's overwhelming. That really made me kind of tend to want to simplify it and, mm -hmm. and look at it instead from one, once you understand the level of complexity of how it is that we sleep, then the next step should be, wow, who made this? Who made this machine? This is an extraordinary engineering feat. We are self-assembling, self-repairing organisms. Mm -hmm. That is miraculous. When you look at the engineering, so we're just starting to scratch the surface on learning how sleep happens. And then you realize it's been happening for literally millions of years that the dinosaurs slept exactly like we do, exactly the same. Their brainstem is the same setup. That means these systems using these chemicals are so unimaginably old. That's exciting and daunting and kind of frightening. But the next thought is, you know, this worked just fine by itself. Something went terribly wrong about 40 years ago. So all we have to figure out is what went wrong. And the cool thing is the brain is designed to fix itself. If you give it back what it was lacking, it is really designed to go, oh, I have what I need. And it will do what it needs to do to repair itself. That gives me hope, frankly. So can I, should we go back to acetylcholine now? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, okay. go ahead. So, so the next exciting part is, after messing around with vitamin D for two years, myself and my patients were all failing. So our sleep got better, but then it got worse again. And now I am so crazy about making sure that everybody sleeps well, that when they don't sleep well, I take responsibility for it. Even if I don't know what I'm doing, and I know that we're out on some frontier, it still drives me to think, this is the most important thing we're doing every night. If we don't get the sleep, we're not going to repair. We're all aging faster. So I'm very driven. And because I'm kind of desperate at this point, because I don't know what else to do, because now the D level is perfect. We've published an article. We've said a D level of 60 to 80 is exactly the right level to have perfect sleep. But despite having a D level of 65, I'm not sleeping well, and my patients aren't either. And it's becoming obvious that the brain is looking for something else. There's some other thing that's missing. And a couple of the things that didn't get better with vitamin D, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, belly issues, which are common, and at least a third of my patients had those primary complaints, that didn't go away. I thought the bugs were going to respond to the D and get better. Didn't happen. Second thing was that my patients didn't lose weight. I know they were obese because their D was low, but giving the D back didn't lead to weight loss. 
And now there's some new things happening. So there was new kinds of pain that were walking in, patients who had originally come to see me just for a headache. Now they're saying I have this terrible pain all over, I don't have an answer for it. So uh, an accidental turn of fate brought a patient with a book to see me and said, here, I think you'll like this book. It was about pantothenic acid, which is truly a vitamin. I really am not an expert in vitamins. I have become an expert in pantothenic acid because nobody else cares about it. So she hands me this book. I finally read it. There are really important references about pantothenic acid in the 1950s. But very old experiments, very few people, they have never been repeated. They were done in convicts, and they blocked pantothenic acid and showed that within two weeks, the people where you blocked this B5, so pantothenic acid is B5, if you block it, within a couple of weeks, you get trouble sleeping, belly complaints, a funny puppet-like gait, and burning in the hands and feet. So the reason why the patient brought it to me was the author of this book was a layperson, was giving it to people who had rheumatoid arthritis. But she made the comment that not only do this, does their pain get better, but their sleep gets better too. At the time, all she commented on was that we know that B5 or pantothenic acid has to be used by the adrenal gland to make cortisol. So that's the only connection that I had. Mm -hmm. So with that information, I'm desperate. I go and buy 400 milligrams of pantothenic acid at the health food store because that's the dose that it says to use in the book. And I pick up B100. So the only thing I remember about the Bs is for medical school, if you give one B, you should give all of them. And because I'm really feeling insecure and I don't think I'm an expert, I happen to pick up two bottles. Long story short, 400 milligrams of pantothenic acid in someone who has a normal D level is way too much. And instead of sleeping better, out of the 40 people that I gave this to, I only used it in that dose for a week because by the end of the week, I had terrible restless legs morning and night. So I realized within two or three days, uh-oh, this is going to be terrible because this dose is too big. Even though I'm giving the recommended dose, it is making my sleep worse. Because I'd had now two years of experience with D, and I've become generally skeptical about what's written about vitamins because we're really sloppy about it, I'm now pretty suspicious. My patients start to come back and tell me the same thing. This stuff, this 400 milligrams, it made me so agitated and I couldn't sleep at all, so I stopped it after two days. And they would come in and use exactly the same phrases that another person didn't use last week. I mean, I'm picturing these things as safe, easy, you know, vitamins are extra, that's what we've been told. No, these people are coming back as though I gave them uh, methamphetamine. I mean, they are freaked out, angry, and a few of them did what I did, which was to stop the 400 milligrams of pantothenic acid, continue on B100, and like magic, in one day, my sleep's better and my pain is gone. And I won't tell anybody about it because I'm too freaked out. They already think I'm crazy with the vitamin D anyway. But my patients start to trickle back in, and a few of them say exactly the same thing. This 400 milligrams, this made me so agitated, I stopped it in a day, but then I took the B100, and my pain went away in a day. I mean, it was so weird. I went, oh, this what happened to me. What, what's up with that? These observations are the basis of reading then a whole bunch of articles about what could be happening. Why are my patients saying this makes them agitated? This, vitamins are not supposed to go into your brain and act like a drug. I mean, that's not what we were taught. Also, why would they... Why would all these people be saying 400 milligrams is the right dose? Why is it sitting there innocently on the shelf in 400 milligrams when it's way too big a dose? Could it be that my patients who are taking vitamin D for two years are chemically different than the patients who have rheumatoid arthritis? That's a really unique idea. The final picture is, yeah, they're different. And you know why? Because vitamin D, when it goes into that area in the ponds that you referred to, the base part of the brain, one of the places where we have these sleep switches, there are vitamin D receptors all over those sleep switches. But more importantly, when the vitamin D goes in there and hits that vitamin D receptor, what does it do? It turns out there's an article from the 1980s 
from a woman who was a student of Walter Stump, who took his literature, took his stuff that said, hey, the nucleus reticularis pontus oralis caudalis has vitamin D receptors. And they went the next step and they said, okay, what do the vitamin D receptors do when you hit them and you turn them on? They make choline acetyltransferase. They make the final enzyme that makes acetylcholine. So it took me several years to fall into that. The second piece of the equation is that in order to make acetylcholine, you need the raw material. So you need choline and you need acetyl. The acetyl comes from coenzyme A, and pantothenic acid is part of the backbone of coenzyme A. So the equation turns out to be coenzyme A, parentheses, pantothenic acid, plus vitamin D equals acetylcholine. When you think of it that way, it's a totally different way to think about how our brain works. So number one, that means there's a vitamin we're getting from somewhere. We're going to talk in a minute about where we get it. There's a vitamin we get that goes straight into the, from the GI tract, into the blood, straight into the brain, and appears to make acetylcholine be made. That's kind of a, a crazy idea. There's something we're eating that is being immediately converted into something that could make us agitated and not able to sleep or to feel perfect and sleep wonderfully. Now, number one, that means it's not in the food. I'm sorry, it can't be in that form and uncontrolled in the food. Otherwise, we'd be all over the place. There wouldn't be ever a normal sleep pattern. So the first thing that I ran up against was all of the literature at the time, and still does, says pantothenic acid deficiency does not exist because it's in every food. Well, it can't be. I just experienced it. My patients experienced it. What, what went wrong? Who, who made the wrong turn? Coenzyme A turns out to be in every food. So they made a little wrong conclusion and said, oh, coenzyme A is in every food, and we must break it down into B5 and absorb it and use it. Well, that turns out to be not substantiated. There are no articles that show that. The second piece is that no one has actually ever studied whether or not we get B5 from the bacteria that live inside us or whether we get it from the food. No one's really studied that. We do know that bacteria that live inside us make a lot of B vitamins. Now, what happened eventually was, I, I said, wait a minute, this, it's quite obvious. If there are several people writing about the basic science of the B vitamins and they will list every B vitamin, say riboflavin, it's B2, it has a colonic bacteria source and a food source. It has a source from the GI tract, from the bacteria, and a food source. Thiamine, B1, has a source from the microbiome and a source from the food. If bears can live in the ground for six months feeding their cubs without any food, where are they getting the B vitamins? If these are daily vitamins that we pee out, that means they have to have a source inside them. That's always been the case. That means if we switch our point of view just slightly and we say B vitamins, maybe they're all made by the bacteria. All of a sudden, my patients who I know have the wrong bacteria, they all have IBS, we're all trading recipes for probiotics, mm -hmm. we're trying to get the microbiome back. So lucky for me, there's a parallel literature that's making even all the lay people know that our bacteria aren't right. The question is, how do we get them back, and why did they go wrong? So my observation was, they went bad at the same time that D went low, but I have two years of experience saying that D by itself didn't bring them back. What if, oh, and the other thing I just read was, there are four specific phyla, so four groups of bacteria. What if those four have always hung out together as a little symbiotic foursome? And what they really are doing is trading bees. They don't even know we exist. They just happen to hang out as a four pack because they give each other bees. And we have evolved on this planet with bugs inside us always. So we never really developed the, the, the mechanisms to make these chemicals because we didn't have to. Instead, we just enslaved the bacteria and we use theirs. Okay. So if I put that idea in my head, all of a sudden, I think, 
oh, could that mean that the good guys that we should have inside there have been receiving my D that I'm giving all my patients, but what they were missing were their buddies' Bs, okay? So this guy makes thiamine, but his other buddy makes riboflavin, and they're trading, but there are these piles of poop in between them now. So there are some of the good guys down there, but they're not the predominant bacteria. Well, what I've just done with my patients by giving them B100, B100 is all eight Bs, 100 milligrams of each. So I'm flooding their GI tract now with lots and lots of Bs. If I'm right that this is gonna bring the bugs back, then the next, the next thing I'm anticipating is, whoa, what if the bugs come back they're making all the right doses of the bees because we've been running on them all this time. All of our biology has been formed around the doses of these eight chemicals that these bugs make. Now I'm giving 100 milligrams of each extra. Uh, the reason why I told you about what happened when I put 400 milligrams of B5 is because when you double the dose, so if the bugs grow back and I still keep taking this 100 milligrams in the bottle, all of a sudden I can't sleep and I'm all revved up and I feel awful. So I started to tell my patients that and that is exactly what happened. So at the three month mark, I now tell people who are following my program, you have to stop these extra Bs because a combination of D plus B100, or in this case we're using B50 now, that combination, it makes the perfect environment to favor the healthy four pack to grow back. Once they're back, then you have to treat these vitamins with great respect because you're adding on to now the normal doses. That's what happened when all of us took 400 milligrams. So, and I have another story about them that I think is really interesting if, you, if you're interested. I, one of the really fascinating things. Can I make one comment though? Yeah, sure. Um, so it, when you're talking about the gut flora and, and the intricate symphony between all the different flora um there's so many different things that can upset or damage that intricate balance and obviously antibiotic, antibiotics can do that um they've also shown in multiple sleep studies with multiple um sleep deprivation studies that that also alters the gut flora you know from good to bad the ratios change um and even toxins you know glyphosate is a major um uh, chemical in you know, a fruit supply that also kind of damages the gut flora. So there's so many different pathways that can alter that, and you're, you're constantly fighting against that, against the grain. Um, and so yes, you have to do other things you're talking about, but also have to consider addressing all these other issues simultaneously. I completely agree, and I think those are all good comments. Let me tell you what drives me still. One, glyphosate is really important. And I'm thrilled that there are people who are pushing legislation about Roundup. But I can't help my patients sitting there with me today with that legislation. Right. The second thing is most of our sleep studies done in humans are done in a, in a paradigm where we take a normal human, a assumed normal human, and we sleep deprive them. And we see what happens to them. But that is not what's wrong with my patients. My patients haven't been sleep deprived by an experimental paradigm. They are sick. Something has happened to them and now they can't sleep. Mm -hmm. So you're, and so when we, when we come back around to the end, the final story is no matter what you do chemically to your body, if you do things that then sleep deprive you. So if you get completely chemically back to normal and you join in a, in a special kind of experiment that sleep deprives you, you will still see what you just described. It will change your microbiome. So there is an aspect that's about habit, that's about avoiding things like alcohol. There are things that we do that short our sleep. I would like all of my patients to get to a place where their sleep is so good that every once in a while, they can have two glasses of wine, okay? They're not gonna have a shot of Roundup and they're not gonna go for two nights and not sleep if they're smart, okay? But maybe they're in residency and they have to do that, okay? I want them to get to a health place where when those things happen to fall on their body, like the COVID illness, I want them sleeping so well and having these vitamins so great that when something comes along, 
that their body has to deal with that they're actually able to overcome that challenge, okay? It doesn't mean that those things that you mentioned are not true. There's one other really important point, and that is we doctors make up reasons. When somebody says, well, my, why is my belly so screwed up? We make up legends. We make up theories about it. It's not that they're wrong. It's just that if I can't change those and I come up with some other explanation, then maybe we have to have a mind that's open enough to appreciate the other one. One of the really interesting things about our microbiome is our microbiome makes antibiotics. In fact, we discovered antibiotics by studying bacteria. So the original studies that were done on growing bacteria were done after Pasteur poured a liquid in a Petri dish and then watched these little things grow and then he looked at them under the microscope. And one, early on, they noticed that around this little white fuzzy lump was a clear area where other white fuzzy lumps couldn't grow into it. And they started asking, I wonder if they're making some chemical that's killing their competitors. Yes, that's what they were doing. Mm -hmm. That means that we took, we took penicillin from, from that antibiotic from our microbiome. Now, what that means to me is, when you get back your normal microbiome, you can still take antibiotics. They really won't hurt you. Your microbiome will still come back. We've told everyone that the reason why they lost their microbiome was glyphosate, stress, antibiotics, sleep toxin, I mean, uh, food toxins. And that might be right. It's not that they're, not, that they're wrong. It's just that it looks to me like my patients have been able to generate a normal microbiome pretty easily with B50 and D. And that combination together, the only time I see somebody go back into having IBS challenges is when they let their D drop below 30 again. So if you keep it above 40, the bacteria are usually pretty happy. There's another really interesting story that relates to why there are eight chemicals called B. Like, that doesn't make any sense, really. A was discovered, it was the first vitamin, and then, oh, there are eight things called B. Why? Why didn't they call them B, C, D, E, and F? And the reason is they all came out of a bacterial culture. So the original experiments, what Pasteur was using to pour into that Petri dish was from a liquid that was generated, that was being used by the healers of that time, which is nutritional yeast. Yeast, you put it in, it's the same stuff you use to make beer and bread. You stick it in a jar, you let it sit there. If you've ever tried to make beer or bread, and you read the instructions, you have to leave it at room temperature. You can't boil it or you'll screw it up. You can't get it too cold or you'll screw it up. What you're really doing as you leave it there is, the yeast is growing, the yeast makes D2, the bacteria from the water and the air come and collect, they use the D2 that comes from the yeast and they make eight B vitamins and they feed them to the yeast. You can actually go online and buy nutritional yeast. It's called nutritional yeast. It has all eight Bs. It is the original place where those four phyla bacteria all showed up together. They all require D2. The bacteria are not picky about what kind of D. Yeast makes a very old, historically ancestral chemical called D2. All other animals, starting from even worms, insects, all multi-celled organisms that make D on their skin, birds, mammals, fish, insects, all make another chemical called D3. Oddly enough, medicine is still stuck not realizing this and is still giving D2 as a green pill once a week. It is not good for sleep. Absolutely, humans do not like that chemical. Your bugs don't care. They're evolutionarily very, very old. They would be happy with D2. But your sleep system really wants D3, which is what we and all the other animals make, okay? If you look at it that way, then there's a lot of really interesting stuff that's coming out of the GI literature about how when we reconstitute our microbiome, what we're doing is we're spreading all these organisms, not only bacteria, but yeast, fungus, virus, they make antibiotics. 
That means anti-life. So they make things that kill other bacteria, that kill other viruses. They may actually make antiviral chemicals that protect us. So now we know a depth of how the microbiome interacts with our immune system, and it is mind-boggling. It is many, many articles deep in many different ways. We think that there might be actual connections, direct connections between the microbiome through the vagus nerve up into the brain. You might actually have bacteria that naturally grow in the brain. That's so different than the way I was taught. That implies that these bacteria have been with us since the very beginning, since way, way, way before primates came. And that they're incorporated in our biology in these amazingly deep ways. Now, what that means to me is, if I can get my client to have a good D level, i.e. one that used to be there all the time when we lived outdoors, and I can get a good D level in their belly, then they have the right microbiome, then I'm starting with a whole human being. Because in the last 40 years, we now have millions of people who have been born and are living their lives without an organ of their body. The microbiome is an organ of the body. It does a million different things that we don't even know about, but the loss of that organ of the body has led to probably most of the chronic illnesses that we're seeing and most of the developmental problems that we're seeing there, it's definitely leading to a change in the immune system of all the children. So children who are born without this are put at a huge disadvantage. Autoimmunity is up. Their ability to react normally to, to immunizations is totally different. They aren't the same human population as my generation being given uh, immunizations. They're not the same humans. I agree. So given that bigger, giver, given that bigger picture, even if there are challenges, even if glyphosate is still there and we still have to take antibiotics, I think that the outcome is more likely to be more positive and that we can probably put up with a little sleep deprivation if we need to and be able to make it up the following day. Let me stop and let you ask questions. We have to come back to acetylcholine. Right? <laughs> what? Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to make a kind of more of a broad observation and comment. Um, you know, when I first started to get into the sleep field, I went into it from a, an ENT perspective, an airway perspective, and that's what kind of led me into this whole era, area of health and wellness through better breathing. And, and that was my, my nail, my hammer. My field is the hammer and the breathing aspect is, is, a, is a nail. And I have to admit that it, it's still a very major component of, of the problems that I'm seeing. But I have to admit that over the past you know, five to 10 years, I've had to learn that it's not just about breathing, but it's other components that contribute to health, and neurologically, hormonally, metabolically, uh, environmentally. Um, and I'm more and more humble year by year as I learn these new concepts and, and integrate it, which actually makes much more sense. And so you giving this discussion with us is, is just kind of solidifying this, this general idea of wellness and, and, and health that, um, that I, I think doctors need to take more notice of. Um, you can't really focus on one enzyme or one molecule to make you healthier. You have to look at the big picture. So I really appreciate you you're giving us this new insight. Uh, Stephen, I want to compliment you for the part that you've done, which is when I did my first interview with you and I looked at your website and you were talking about how the lower face was changing uh evolutionarily in our young in our young kids and i was like oh yeah right no way and then <laughs> the last three or four years i spent all my time with dentists oh my god you're right on target that is absolutely true there's no question about that and then the next piece was okay well why can't they breathe through their nose mm -hmm. why is mouth breathing on the rise what's up with that and i have to tell you just in the last year mostly because i'm more interested in substantiating so I don't sound like I'm crazy, there are now articles that talk about secretions coming from the lining of the nasal mucosa that are directly derelated, not necessarily related to bees or the microbiome, but directly derelated so that nasal congestion is probably at least three or four things deep. There's allergy, there's the B5, yeah. there's, you know, there's all sorts of things that have to do with the autonomic system where we know if you 
change the autonomic input, you get more nasal congestion. So the funny thing about it is there's this interweaving of D plus the autonomic system leads to nasal congestion. Nasal congestion leads to inability to be able to breastfeed because you can't breastfeed effectively. You can't breathe through your nose. And oh my goodness, what if you can't close your mouth when you're sleeping? Yeah. That leads to all these anatomic changes. So I would like to compliment you on what you said. Over the last three or four years, I have also begun to embrace the fact that it's never just one thing. The more things we understand, the more things we know, the more people we're going to help. And so I'm, I'm as excited about that as you are. And thank you again for allowing me to talk on your forum because you have a really, you have a great forum and, and you yourself have really good ideas. Right. So you want to go back to acetylcholine or? Yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's, let's go on. Yeah, let's go on to continue with acetylcholine. Okay. So even though acetylcholine is a very difficult uh, chemical to remember because nobody ever talks about it, it's not like, oh, adrenaline, everybody wants to talk about it, no. Acetylcholine now has a basis for <clears throat> scientific experiments showing that one of the major problems with uh, development of autism is lower acetylcholine levels in the brain. That their brain growth is different, their neurotransmitter mix is different. Not only does it mean that they can't sleep, but their development is actually affected by this. ADHD, probably the core problem is that they don't have enough acetylcholine. And Parkinson's disease is now turning out to be, have an acetylcholine deficiency phase that precedes when the dopamine goes low. So acetylcholine is gonna turn out to be one of the chemicals of the next decade. It's gonna be a big deal. The reason why we haven't talked about it much is we don't have any drugs. So there haven't been drug companies coming and saying, hey, this is a chemical that is a direct acetylcholine agonist that took away REM behavioral disorder. Oh, REM behavioral disorder must be low acetylcholine. We don't have those drugs. Nobody pays attention to the fact that the Parkinson's patients who smoke did better. They did. We have articles about that. Nobody knows what to make of it. So my experience with B5, <clears throat> again, sort of by accident, led to me accidentally seeing REM behavioral disorder go away with a specific dose of B5, which was mind-boggling because at the time, I thought of REM behavioral disorder as being a Parkinson's precursor you have rem behavioral disorder we now say you have a one in two chance of developing parkinson's disease within 10 to 20 years and my patient's rem behavioral disorder went away when she went on the equivalent of b50 went away overnight boom gone and it had been gone but i had told her husband to take the b50 out of that milkshake he'd been giving her because i thought it was hurting her so he took it away and all and he calls me two days later and said she's beating me up all night again I said, what do you mean she's beating you up? You've never mentioned that. REM behavioral disorder is not the complaint of the patient. It's the complaint of the spouse. So having seen this thing that I know is acting just like acetylcholine, I'm then able to go to the literature and find, oh, there are a bunch of other people thinking the same way. You now have imaging studies that show if you can, if you can hook an imaging precursor to acetylcholine receptors, then you can image the brain of early Parkinson's disease and show that they have acetylcholine uh, deficits all over the place. So not only, the only place that it's been talked about a lot is in dementia. Dementia, acetylcholine has been a big player since the beginning or since early times, okay? I want to lead you into, the, into another article that just came out that I just got from one of my clients that talks about... Um, Protein pump inhibitors. So everything we take for uh, acid one. reflux. Okay. One of the most commonly given medicines that there is. New, a new article that just came out in an Alzheimer's um, journal from a group out of the Karolinska, in, Karolinska Institute in Sweden that does incredible science and shows that every single one of those drugs completely inhibits choline acetyltransferase binds to it and effectively takes it out you can't make acetylcholine now their their science is extraordinary and i think they anticipated that there was going to be a big pushback 
by the pharmaceutical industry because they were really careful. Their article is beautifully written. And um, let me see if I can give you the reference. I can't. Um, anyway, well, send, you can send it along later it. and we'll put it in the uh, show notes. Okay. This is a very important article because the guys who wrote this have spent a lot of time thinking about where does isotylcholine show up in the nervous system? What does it do? The things that they've paid attention to are Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, all of the things that are like Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia, um, any of the things that where we see uh, brainstem deterioration happening early and ALS, and they trace through how these diseases are all linked to acetylcholine supplies. Mm -hmm. Then their next comment is about how acetylcholine and choline acetyltransferase play a role in when the, it appears that when the acetylcholine levels are low, we actually might make beta amyloid as a way to offset that problem. So they connect it to not only the formation of amyloid plaques, but then the next part was that apoptosis may be one of the results of not having enough acetylcholine, that there are receptors on the mitochondria. So they linked acetylcholine deficiency to all these degenerative pathways that play a role in many different degenerative diseases. So the exciting part about that is for me, one, I think I now have a way for us all to get the acetylcholine levels coming back from the microbiome. So we need the natural supply that's coming from the microbiome and some beginning of clinical studies with my clients on how to replace these B vitamins in a safe way that doesn't make people go crazy and be agitated and not able to sleep and sort of preliminary ways to use them to find out what acetylcholine level your body feels comfortable with at the time. So one, we usually think of acid, those of us neurology anyway, think of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. But most of the effects are actually in the brain. And a huge part of acetylcholine is in the autonomic nervous system. So let's go down that path for a minute. The autonomic nervous system is an automatic nervous system. It runs all sorts of things, so we won't have to think about it. Swallowing, how does my stomach empty? How does my GI tract make propulsive movements? How do I poop on my own without even thinking about it, being able to wait until I can get to a bathroom? These things are all things we take for granted. My pupils open, I can sweat, I can manage my temperature. That's all done by the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is two interlocking opposite nervous systems. One of them is fight flight. That's the sympathetic nervous system. That's the one we talked about that uses adrenaline or epinephrine. The second half is the parasympathetic, and it's called rest and digest. And it turns out that the neurotransmitter that is used by the parasympathetic does calm during the day. So anxiety levels in people who don't have enough acetylcholine are usually through the roof. As soon as you start them on B50 and D, the anxiety comes right down. So that word rest is referring not only to how they feel during the day, the level of agitation, internal agitation, but also to sleep. So acetylcholine is one of the chemicals that runs that whole system. Now, what if I could put together a legend or a story that would say, gee, 40 years ago, our population did this behavioral change. We went indoors, we made air conditioning, we made sunscreen, we're told that we should avoid the sun. And at the same time, we started to see all these other things start to happen. Hypertension, heart disease, stroke, diabetes. Could there be any connection so if I tell you we're in fight flight all the time, that's all over the place. We're in fight flight all the time because, well, it's damn scary right now. The coronavirus is everywhere. But oddly enough, we know that if we have practices like meditation or breathing exercises, we can actually calm ourselves down. Those techniques are all techniques that make the parasympathetic system come up. They all make the acetylcholine go up. So 
what would humans look like if you took away, let's just say I made you acetylcholine deficient. Your heart rate would go up, your blood pressure would go up, your, <clears throat> your level of anxiety would go up, your fight flight would be dominant all the time. All you would, so it turns out I have a bunch of clients who are wearing sleep trackers that measure heart rate variability. It's really simple to do. How, how much variation is there from beat to beat in my heart? I have clients who are saying, I just started my B50 and my heart rate variability went sky high. So when you're in fight flight, it stays the same. It doesn't vary very much. I now have lay people who have got these trackers on who can tell me what their heart rate variability is. They can basically just tell me, I just added a bunch of acetylcholine to my autonomic nervous system. And we're all actually manipulating acetylcholine levels there. So what I just wrote back to these guys out of the Karolinska Institute is, you don't know this, but you just wrote something and you just understand these enzymes and acetylcholine so well, and they're so pivotal for sleep and the basic medical problems that we in medicine deal with, that all of a sudden someone's going to invite you to take part in studies of lay people who can actually tell you what their acetylcholine levels are. So we're actually at a place where you could take away, theoretically, you could take away something and say, well, if I take Prilosec away, what happens to my heart rate variability? I have to be wearing an R ring. I could probably answer that for you. So we're in now, I think, we're into like a new, um, the next 10 years is all, is all going to be about acetylcholine. What role does it play in multiple parts of our body? Um, not only our memory and our mood, but all, you know, GI tracts. So I think it's an absolutely fascinating time to know how to put back together the microbiome watch how much b5 the microbiome makes no one's ever studied that um there are many many studies suggested by this and a lot of them ultimately intertwine with sleep and i have to say that in the final analysis what you do to make your patients sleep better and what i do to make my patients sleep better are just as important because every single thing that helps all of us sleep better the final outcome is always about how well we sleep, whether it's about knowing about these little pieces, these little puzzle pieces that I'm doing chemically or about making the anatomy right. Normal sleep is really the best outcome of all. Well said. <laughs> you know, this, um, this reminds me of this quote, and I can't remember the source. It's a very famous sleep professional, um, and it's something like, Sleep is of the brain, for the brain, from the brain. Ooh, that's cool. Yeah, I heard it's a good one. Before. It's a good one, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's so true. Um, yes, you need to breathe well. You need to um, have the right environment. But ultimately, the brain is what creates sleep. But sleep is not, like you said, it's not a dormant state. It's, it's a very active state of the body where it's uh, healing and rejuvenating, restoring the body. So... Um, so it's unfortunate that most of modern society just take it for granted and just it's a the first thing that gets sacrificed when you're out of time when you have things to do. Can we make a few comments about COVID and vitamin D since we're oh ab ab two? absolutely oh you know what that's we're actually doing a study on that right now and there's been a couple <laughs> of um, preliminary studies that have some some interesting results. But why don't you tell us your your take on that? So one of the I try to stay out of it because I've been, um, you know, treated like I was a vitamin D weirdo for so long, and I'm, I'm a little sensitive about that. But now on the front page, uh, if you have darker skin, you'll have a worse outcome from the coronavirus. If you uh, happen to be in the southern hemisphere, mm -hmm. so that the virus hit at the end of the summer instead of in the spring, you might have a better outcome. Um, both of those things speak to vitamin D. So one of the things that's misinterpreted a lot is vitamin D levels are lower in those who have more melanin in their skin mm -hmm. because the melanin is there because we're all bald. So there are very few animals on this planet that don't have some sort of a coating. So the, the reason why vitamin D was discovered on the skin of pigs is because pigs and humans are both bald. And that means we absorb it directly. But the great majority of animals, reptiles, birds, lick their skin or lick their scales or preen their feathers. 
So that means the only reason why we needed a sunscreen, i.e. melanin, is because we can make too much vitamin D and absorb it. So humans come in different colors related to the fact that you make too much vitamin D, it's just as dangerous as not enough. That means that when we move into this last 40 year span where we're living indoors, people who make it slower, so when you walk outdoors and you're wearing melanin, you make D more slowly and it has a huge effect on your health. That means we have to make a big step to try to teach people who have darker skin that they shouldn't really be wearing long sleeve shirts in the pool. <laughs> that is not their thing. It's the white pink people who have to wear long sleeve shirts in the pool. So that is a really important piece. And the second thing that's hit the, the news on the front page is if you're obese, you have a worse outcome. And what is written about vitamin D, which I think is insulting, is that fat people have more fat to dissolve the vitamin D. That's why their vitamin D is low and they require bigger doses. No, that's not right. Mm. It's true that it's fat soluble, but the actual way to look at it is they became obese because their D was profoundly low. And when their D went down and their microbiome went wrong, they went into permanent winter and their microbiome said, I don't care what you need these calories for. I'm putting them into fat because that's my job. We're in winter. You're supposed to be gaining weight. So their appetites are affected. And what they do with their calories is actually affected by having low D through the microbiome. What I'm hoping will be the outcome of that is we've brought the public to face, gee, if my vitamin D is better, I'll have a better outcome if I get this virus. What I'm hoping will result is a much wider spectrum of interest in vitamin D, recognizing that it's not about bones, it's never been a vitamin, that it's a really important hormone, and if it affects the immune system, that could mean your kid who gets sick all the time, your kid who just developed a weird autoimmune disease because of COVID, those are all related to the original domino, which is D, and then the microbiome. So I'm really hoping that'll open up the view of the public and hopefully eventually the MDs about the way they look at D. I have to say that over the past couple of years, I've been almost routinely testing for vitamin D. And in my patients in particular, whether they're light skin or dark skin, thin or obese, I would say about 95% are low or severely low. Yeah. Um, and even if they're normal, they're still, it's, it's rare, but it's on the low side. Um, it's um, not surprising. Um, also, I did a very informal analysis of that, these internet charts of all the countries with COVID. And if you kind of look at it, and with some exceptions, the equatorial areas are pretty sparse. Um, in the Southern hemisphere, like you said, it's better than the Northern hemisphere. And obviously there's some reporting, variations of reporting issues, but um, in general, the warmer the climate, the sunnier, um, they, tend to, they tend to have better outcomes. And there's, there's one other piece that you kind of wouldn't expect, and that is, is as you move up in your socioeconomic group, mm -hmm. so if you look at southern India, where everybody has very dark skin, mm -hmm. what I think they're going to find is the people who are still living outdoors, who are extremely poor, who mm -hmm. their only option is to work out in the fields, right. they have the same color skin as their neighbors who are software engineers, Mm -hmm. And all of Hyderabad has got software engineers with really dark skin. So I think what we're going to see is a different outcome because as you move up on the socioeconomic ladder, you can work indoors. Mm -hmm. And as a practice, you socialize indoors now. You socialize on a veranda. <laughs> you are not forced to be digging in the dirt, which therefore means, therefore means you have to be standing in the sun. In our country, and when I give this as a historical perspective, when looking at our grandparents who were still running a farm in South Oklahoma, they were doing well up until their early 70s. They're skinny, they're wiry, they're strong as can be, they're out there picking cotton in 100 degree weather. That means their autonomic nervous system is peak form at age 72. Those people who are still able to do that now are almost always still tending a garden. You yep. can't have a garden in your living room very effectively. Some people do, but it's under sun lamp. So most people who have gardens, they have to be out in the sun tending that garden. So correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I know, I've not heard about any 
um, COVID outbreaks in farm workers, only indoor food processing plants, right? I'll be really interested to see because that, that's my suspicion is if you're living outdoors, one of the things that I saw and the reason why I'm, I'm aware of this socioeconomic change is I had a house in Mexico and the guys that were helping us with our house was a wonderful man and he had a stroke at age 42. His parents lived into their 90s, but right down the road, he has other Mayan relatives who are still digging in the dirt with a stick. The whole village still speaks Mayan. They still live in stick houses. There's no air conditioning because there's no walls. Mm -hmm. And he's failing faster because he has an education. He speaks English. He's able to be the supervisor. He's sitting in the veranda directing other people who are doing the hard work, scooping up the seaweed from the sea. And when he gets a taxi license, he has an air conditioned taxi. So even though he's moving up, his physical health is moving down. That's hard to sort out from the background. That would be hard to pick out unless you kind of recognize, oh, he's not actually standing out in the sun anymore, and his skin is dark. To prepare him for that, he's not doing it anymore. I have a similar story. I see this all the time in my practice. Um, I will see lots of um, police officers uh, in their mid-40s, 50s, and I ask them, when you were in your 20s, when you joined the police force, were you healthy or not? Well, I was very healthy. I was very skinny, very fit. And then what ends up happening is they do such a good job, they get promoted to a desk job. Exactly. <laughs> and then they start to gain weight, get sick, get full of medications. Yeah, they're not outside anymore. They're not walking the beach anymore. They're exactly. sitting at the desk. Right. Yep. You're so smart. It's, it's just, it's just, I mean, it's just, it's just anecdotal, but there's some amount of truth to that, no matter what profession you're in. Absolutely true. And I think doctors are some of the sickest populations of people I know. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the things we're seeing is we, we stress ourselves out. We make us, you know, work mm -hmm. shifts. We make us work nights. Um, those are all very dangerous things, actually. Uh, uh, before you finish, can you comment a little bit about uh, limb movements versus leg syndrome, because I think you mentioned that in Dr. McCullough interview. Um, I'm okay. sure it's probably linked to this somehow and, and maybe add some comments about iron also. Okay. Um, let me start with this a general comment that I look at this a little bit differently. When I started to look into the nuclei or the clumps of neurons, the clumps of cells in the brainstem that manage us getting paralyzed in sleep, I got kind of freaked out by that. I mean, I thought, wow, we're going to get paralyzed. This is, that's frightening. Like, how do we stay alive? What do you mean we get paralyzed? But when you figure out that there's a cell that turns off the muscle or the joint to make it not move so that moving parts can get repaired, that makes sense. But then there's the next concept, which is if they can turn them off, they have to be able to activate them again. They have to be able to turn them on. Well, then that implies that, one, the system was designed so that this paralysis event should only happen while you're deeply asleep. Because if you're driving down the road and it happens to you, you're toast, very bad. That means that the ability to go into sleep, that the sleep switches that run timing and advancement of the stages are tightly intertwined with the paralysis switches, so that never ever can you be awake and get paralyzed. Well, as soon as I say that, and I tell you, we have a pandemic of sleep disorders, and if I cheat you of your sleep, your own sleep switches start to get frayed and rusty. They can't repair themselves. They're missing things they need, and they start to malfunction. That means, you're going to start to see people who get paralyzed while they're just hanging out, sitting on their porch. So we made a name for it, cataplexy. We've labeled it as being applied to narcolepsy, hypnagogic hallucinations, which means hallucinating, kind of being one foot in sleep, one foot dreaming, and one foot awake. That should never happen either. So the, the original design was that you can never, ever be awake and asleep at the same time. Most people giggle when you say that. 
because they can't even picture it. But if you say that was the original design and now it's breaking down, then there are going to be these funny presentations. So it turns out now I look at it completely differently. Instead of saying, oh, periodic limb movements of sleep is one of the sleep disorders. Instead, I say, oh, why is it periodic? Does that mean it happens at a certain rate? Yeah, that's what it means. And it means we're walking. There's an old ancient walking nucleus that's right in there where all the sleep switches are. It's supposed to be completely suppressed at the time we're asleep. But sometimes it doesn't get suppressed very well. So those periodic limb movements are happening at a specific rate and they alternate feet. That means, oh, women get bunions after they have babies because the last thing that's moving is their little big toe. Their big toe is doing this all night long because they're deed efficient because the baby sucked it all up. This joint never gets repaired. Oh, why do people get fractures, stress fractures of their foot? Because their feet are walking all night. They're not only walking all day, they're walking all night. That then opens your mind to the possibility that, oh, there are certain parts of my body that are aging more rapidly than other parts because I can't get them paralyzed to get them properly repaired every night. And there'll be certain parts of the body. Carpal tunnel is one of those. Ulnar neuropathy is another one where we're, we have a, a nerve that's in a specific location and we use our hands all day long. That means the people who get carpal tunnel are the ones that are doing this all night long and can't get paralyzed and heal their nerve during the night. That gives you a totally different way to look at this, okay? That also means that things like REM behavioral disorder, well, all of a sudden now I'm thinking of that as, oh, there's a specific place where we turn that off. What's the chemistry of that? Could we actually intercede? And truthfully, I gave all the different kinds of dopamine I could think of because I thought that was a dopamine disorder because it's related to Parkinson's. No, it turns out to be acetylcholine related. The next thing that it brings up is restless leg syndrome, which I have. Mine is probably related to the SNRI that I've been taking for 20 years that I'm still trying to come off. And now we have 20 years of experience that shows that once you get on one of those medicines, coming off of them is very difficult and that you may actually have residual restless legs for months after you get off. To me, that spells the period of time when you're drowsy as you're falling asleep has a very particular chemical footprint. So though we've talked about acetylcholine a lot today and dopamine a little bit, there are 20 neurotransmitters that are active. They all have to be there. They all do their own job and they have to be in certain ratios. So there's a chemical footprint of drowsiness. So those of us who have restless legs are lying there completely relaxed, everything's fine, and then our legs start to do these creepy things where they're jumping. Because I've experienced that very upsetting phenomenon, I am very sympathetic to people who have weird things happen to them where they really don't have any control over their body. The next place that shows up is the flip side of cataplexy. So we talked about narcolepsy has a, having three features, but really there's nothing special about those three features. I can make you have sleep attacks during the day behind the wheel just by sleep depriving you by being a medical resident. You know, there's nothing specific about that. You can also sleep deprive someone to the point of having a waking dream state. We, we learn about that all the time on television. What do they do with a spy? Immediately, they sleep deprive them for four days. They become psychotic. They can't really tell what's reality. So those particular descriptors are being used to make a little package so I can feel like I know my job and I'd say, oh, you have narcolepsy, you have this and this and this. Does that really help people? I don't think so. There's another disease that is the flip side of cataplexy, which is I'm awake, but I fall to the ground and I move around. I flop around like a fish. I look like you need the exorcist. They're wide awake. They can remember what happens to them. Unlike cataplexy, they're not paralyzed, but they have no control over their motor system. That, that I gave a name, kineoplexy, to try to make the, the point that they're struck down by movement instead of struck down by paralysis, those people are told they have pseudo seizures. Always. They go and they have a video EEG monitoring, they have an attack, they fall down, 
the electrodes are up here. They don't see any brain waves going wacky because they're not recording down here because we don't know what to make of those recordings. So they're told that they're actually making it up. I had 12 or 15 people with that. All you have to do is get their D and their microbiome back, get them sleeping normally again, and it goes away. It is a primary sleep switch chemistry disorder that you only arrive at after being sleep deprived a long, long time. There are several other movement disorders that happen during sleep that we don't make much of. I think snoring is really a disorder of paralysis. So if you look at it that way, you can say, oh, if I'm getting paralyzed and when I get into REM sleep, I paralyze this part, immediately you should be like freaked out because even if I have a normal anatomy, I just paralyzed where I'm supposed to breathe through. That's kind of dangerous. So if you get a tiny bit too paralyzed, then you either open your mouth or you snore. Or So some of the things that we think of as being anatomic origin are absolutely in some cases, but you can actually swing into them by having a D or a B5 level when your acetylcholine isn't right and your body becomes a little too paralyzed. So I had the worst snoring I've ever experienced when I ran my D over 80. I started to wake myself up loudly snoring. So if you think of it that way, you think of, oh, disorders of paralysis are movement disorders, and disorders of movement, they're both just opposite sides of the same coin, which is if we were operating correctly, we would be perfectly paralyzed, not endangering ourselves, and still being able to breathe, but paralyzed so we can heal stuff. Did that answer your question? I never thought of it that way. It's really intriguing. Let me tell you one other thing that the yeah. dentists have got me into uh -huh. that is really mind-boggling. When we talk about uh, the oral appliances that the dentists are putting in, yes. one of the really interesting observations was um, Howie Hinden, who's in New York with you, and his son are both putting in oral appliances. So one of the neurologists down the hall sends the kids with Tourette's because he wonders if he has a sleep disorder. And they put an oral appliance in, and the ticks go away like in a minute, okay? Now, one of the fascinating things about that is the dentist then turned to me and said, you know, they're putting this in and it's touching the glossopharyngeal nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve right, goes right back into the brainstem. And I went, I'm a neurologist. I should really know what the glossopharyngeal nerve does. I mean, I know it's the back of the palate. It goes directly into the vagus, directly into the brainstem vagus. So over the last four years as I hang out with the dentist, they teach me all these interesting things, like the third branch of the trigeminal nerve passes right behind the temporal mandibular joint, and they're thinking of grinding or bruxism as stretching that nerve, sending sympathetic messages. They're interlocking it with, oh, the stress of a low oxygen means we do this. But there's another way to think about it, which is, why would there be a nerve that directly gives stimulus to the sympathetic nucleus? No stops along the way. Why would there be another nerve, a sensory nerve, both of them are sensory nerves, that sends directly to the vagus? Well, when you think about what we do when we're sleeping, is we, we, we basically decorticate us. We turn off a switch. Here up, okay? I'm asleep. I am face down on my pillow, and I'm suffocating. But I don't wake up. Who's watching out for me? Who knows that I'm suffocating and makes me roll over? It's all done on a brainstem basis. That means what's still awake? My nasal sensors that tell if there's air moving. My, I'm pulling against, I'm trying to pull in. So there are sensors in the palate that are saying, uh-oh, big negative pressure. Uh-oh, somebody's trying to put a pillow over her face, okay? So there are systems in place that are all sensory in the face and inside the mouth that when you think about it from terms of sleep and protecting us during sleep, they make perfect sense. It's just that I never learned the anatomy in that way. So um, is there anything else you want to tell us about any words of wisdom before you finish this interview? I have two or three summaries. One. Okay. Vitamin D is dangerous stuff. It will give you your life back, 
but you must pay attention to it. You can easily do vitamin D levels. Unfortunately, you can't do them in New York State, New Jersey, or Rhode Island. Ask your legislature to change that. Every single human being needs direct access to being able to do vitamin D levels. In every other state in the union, you can order a vitamin D level, get the correct one done for 39 bucks. Really easy. You go in there, let your blood draw, and you get the results back. Why, I'm sorry, That's why is really that? Important. I've always wondered why is that happening in these states? There must have been a legislative, a le legislative decision that decided that humans were too stupid to look at their own labs. Or somebody wants to make money. But I'll tell you, the U.S. is ahead of most of the world. It is very difficult to get B levels done in Australia, New Zealand. You can get them done in Europe now. There are more and more companies that are trying to make it available to do labs directly to the to the consumer. I think that's a really good move, especially for vitamin D, because my clients are more knowledgeable about vitamin D, the good and bad aspects, than their doctors are. The doctors are behind. So you have to do D levels. It's really important. The second thing is probiotics, even though everybody's making a lot of money on them, they are not the answer. You can take bacteria, you can eat bacteria, you can go outside and eat dirt if you want. It's not going to make the self-sustaining foursome that you need. What they need is D plus B50 for three months. Once they're back, you keep your D level up and you're good to go. The next piece is the B vitamins and your sleep have some complicated issues to know about. So once you start vitamin D, you really do need to know about how much Bs do I need? Why do I need them? What do I need for sleeping normally? Do I, can I get pain from this? We just got our very first article that shows that if you drop the D supply in a mouse model, the amount of D you feed them is dropped, the actual microbiome changes, certain species die off, and it turns out that those species were the ones that provided the raw materials to make the endocannabinoids. That means your endocannabinoid system, which is all about pain, inflammation, sleep, mood, all of the things we're just starting to learn about what the cannabinoids have been doing for us forever, they're linked to D in the microbiome also. That means once you start dabbling in this, you really do want to go to my website and learn how they're all connected and how to do it safely. I have a workbook that's called the Right Sleep Workbook. It takes you through an entire year of how to follow the program, how to understand what's happening to you at points along the way, how to do it safely and come out of it with better sleep and feeling better. What's your website again? www.drgomanac.com. Now I've been told that that is not a very good website name because nobody knows that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I am the only Gomanac on the whole planet because it's kind of a made up <laughs> name. So if you just put into Google, Goma something or other and vitamin D, my website will pop up. But the doctor is D-R, not D-O-C-T-O-R, right? It's D-R-G-O-M-I-N-A-K. Great. Thank you very much. Now, I really appreciate you taking time to talk with us and, um, and discussing these fascinating topics. Hopefully, we can um, talk again in the future. Okay. I would love to, Stephen. I always love being in your interviews. You're so smart. It's always a pleasure having you as well. Thanks again, everyone, for tuning in today. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, you can get all the show notes and the resources mentioned in the program at drstephenpark.com forward slash gomanak3. That's G-O-M-I-N-A-K number three. And while you're there, please check out all the resources we have available at the website and subscribe to the podcast in either iTunes, Stitcher, or Downcast, or wherever you find it easy to listen to. You can listen to Dr. Gomanak's past interviews as well. And one last thing. If the information you heard today has helped you in any way, I'd love for you to give this podcast a rating and review, or better yet, forward this to a friend or someone you know who can benefit from this information. Thanks again for spending some time with me and for helping others improve their health as well. Until next time, wishing that you breathe better and sleep better so that you can live better. Bye-bye.